Number 1. The Woods When I was 16, I got my first job at a local fast food restaurant. Of course, since I was in school during the day, I had to work a second shift job. I was hoping that by working that I would be able to save up some money to buy a car. Until then, however, I had to walk home from the restaurant when I got off work. It really wasn't too bad since the restaurant was in the town that I lived in. The walk may have been a little over half an hour. But the only thing bad about it was I had to walk past this slightly wooded area that I always thought was very creepy. It also was pretty dark and not fenced off, which just made it even freakier. Both of my parents worked early in the morning, and even if they hadn't, they likely wouldn't have come to pick me up since it was such a short walk. One Friday night in the summer, I had just gotten out of work. It was around midnight since the store closed at 11. I got everything cleaned up and began walking home. It was really nice out that night as I was walking along the town street. The sky was clear and I found myself constantly looking up at the constellations because they were very bright. I was looking forward to being home and taking a shower and then maybe playing some video games before going to bed. I did begin to get a little apprehensive as I walked by that wooded area. It was right by a road that led away from the main town road and off to a housing area that I lived in. It wasn't even that far of a walk, but it bugged me because there were no street lamps in that area. It got very dark very quickly, and it didn't get light again until I turned on the next street where the houses were. I made the turn on the wooded street, and I tried my best to just pace myself as I walked along. Hurrying wasn't going to help. For some reason, I get a lot more frightened when I run or hurry. Not sure why. Also, I guess if someone saw me running, I would have been quite humiliated. Sixteen-year-olds really shouldn't be so scared that they try to run down the street. Of course, it wasn't like anyone would have seen me, but I still felt like I was being watched. Hey, kid! I heard a voice off to the side of me say, and I nearly jumped out of my skin. It took everything I had to not take off down the road. Turning around, I looked and didn't see anyone at all. All I saw was a wooded area and the trees. As I was looking, though, a man stepped out from behind a tree. I kid you not, he was dressed like a ringmaster from a circus. He was wearing a black top hat and a red jacket with white pants on. He was very neat, and he had a huge smile on his face. Um, hey, I responded. I shuffled my feet, not knowing what to do. Come over here, kid, the man told me. I want to show you something. I didn't really want to go anywhere near the guy. He didn't make any moves toward me, but he was pretty creepy. No, I actually had to be on my way home, I told him, and started to walk down the street. Come on, kid. It'll only take a second, the man insisted. I want to show you something. Now I know that everyone reading this will just think it would have been stupid for me to just not keep walking. But I've never really been good at conflict and never know how to feel in awkward situations. I motioned again that I was just going to walk home and once again the man told me, Just come on kid, I want to show you something. Against my better judgment, I found myself slowly walking over towards the man. I figured if I just came closer, I could tell what he was up to without getting too close to him. He noticed I was walking towards him, and his already wide grin grew even wider. 
I didn't plan on walking all the way towards him, just close enough to see what he was trying to show me. I wanted to stay as far away as I possibly could. I stopped about one fourth of the way across the street from the guy. He looked at me. Come on, kid, come closer. I want to show you something, he said to me. I think you can show me from where I'm standing, I told him. I was being foolhardy, I can admit, but I could still draw the line between foolhardy and completely stupid. The man looked a little disappointed, but his smile only faltered a little. It did not fade. Okay, that's close enough. I'll get it. The man walked back behind the tree, and he was out of sight for a moment. I thought about leaving when he was behind the tree, but like an idiot, I just stood there. The man was only gone for a moment, and when he came back out from behind the tree, he had something vile in his hand. It looked like he had sewn the top half of a dead chihuahua onto the bottom half of a dead fish, and he did not do a good job at it either. It was covered in dried blood, and one of the dog's eyes was hanging out of its socket. The man smiled at me, and he said, I found a Fiji mermaid. I took off and ran my butt off, and I didn't stop until I got home. Rather than save up for a car, I used my money to buy a bicycle so I could ride home. Number 2. The Ride Home One of the worst decisions I have made in my life was to commute to college. At first it seemed like a really good idea, as I drove 5 miles to the train station and took it into the city. I could do any last minute studying on the train, which I took advantage of. Once I got into the city, I just hopped the bus to school. It sucked having to get up so early in order to do all this, but it was worth it. Or, it was worth it, up until the worst thing happened. My car stopped working. I didn't really know enough about cars in order to fix it. I also didn't have the money to take it to a mechanic. Even worse, I didn't have any family in the area that could loan me money or drive me to the train. I was also past the point where I could drop any classes. If I didn't get to school, I would fail my classes. After worrying about how I was going to get to school, I realised I really only had one choice. I would have to get up earlier in the morning and walk to the train station. Walking five miles was not the biggest deal really. I easily can do seven at the gym on a treadmill. But walking along the side of the road, without a sidewalk, was much harder than walking or running on a treadmill. Plus, it wasn't just five miles one way. It was also five miles home after school. But I really didn't have a choice. The first few days were not that bad, really. Although when I got home at night, my feet were like lead bricks in my shoes. By the time Thursday came around, it was beginning to get to be too much. Plus I had one late class on Thursday, so I would be walking home in the dark. At least it would be easier than walking in the sun. When I got out of the train that night, I set out to walk home. My feet were already throbbing before I had got out of the parking lot. There weren't many cars on the road, and I actually found that quite a relief. It was sort of embarrassing to have to be walking home like that. After I got about a mile down the road and I was feeling terrible, what seemed to be the best possible thing happened. A black luxury car pulled off the road and onto the shoulder. The driver lowered his window and asked me if I needed a ride. I was so happy and relieved that I of course accepted. He motioned for me to get in the passenger side of the car, and I went and got in. He had me buckle my belt up, and he drove off. Although I appreciated the ride, I have to admit the whole situation was rather uncomfortable. Being in the car with someone I really didn't know, and who was actually a much bigger guy than I, was not pleasant. 
He asked me where I was going, and when I told him, he nodded. He asked me what I was doing walking around so late at night in the middle of nowhere. I explained the situation to him, and he nodded. He knew where we were going, and told me he had been in the area for quite a while. After the short talk, the man stopped talking to me. He just looked forward and didn't speak another word to me. It was unnerving. I felt like I should try talking to him, considering that he was doing me a huge favour. But he really didn't seem like he wanted me to talk to him. I therefore just kept quiet and looked forward. The entire rest of the ride, though very short, was dreadful and seemed a lot longer than a four mile drive. I lived on a road with only a few other houses on it, and everyone had already gone to bed by the time the car pulled up. I pointed my house out to the man and then he drove to it, but it stopped before he got to the driveway. When he pulled over, I was very eager to get out of the car and be on my way. I grabbed my book bag with my right hand and was about to get out when the man finally reacted to me. After I opened the latch, the man, remember he was huge, reached over with his right hand and grabbed my right wrist. And he didn't only grab it, he grabbed it hard. I cried out when he did it because it hurt. I looked over at the guy who now had this crazed look in his eye. I asked him to let go of me and he just chuckled at me. I struggled against him and he held me strongly in place. I was very freaked out and was not sure what to do. Please stop, I asked the man. Red wasn't free, is all the man said. And then to my horror, while he still held my right wrist with his right hand, he did something terrifying. He reached down with his left hand and he slowly undid his fly. My eyes grew large as plates while I watched. He actually reached into his fly, then he reached in and pulled himself out of his fly. I yelled at the guy to stop and tried telling him I wasn't gay, not that it mattered. I also tried yelling for help, but the houses on my street were so spread apart that it was unlikely anyone would hear me. With strength much greater than man, the man started moving my hand close to him. I kept trying to pull it away, using every bit of strength I had. He was firmly holding my arm in place and pulling it closer to him. I dreaded the idea of having to touch the guy. Not knowing what else to do, I did the only thing I could think of. I was still trying to pull away, and part of his strength was used to keep trying to move my wrist down. In a flash, I shifted my force downwards, along with the force he was already using. It ended up with his own fist hitting him right in the ball so hard that he yelped and let go of my arm. I was pleased I didn't come in any kind of contact with his parts though. Immediately I grabbed my bag and got out of the door and ran up to my house. As I tried to get my keys out I looked behind and saw the man struggling to get out of the car. Fortunately, I was able to get my keys out and get in the house before the man could get to me. I grabbed my phone and screamed at the man that I was calling the police. He got in his car and left, and I breathed about 20 sighs of relief. The following day, I put up an ad on the school bulletin board, advertising for a ride share on the way home. I found one so quickly that I kicked myself for being too stupid to have not done this before. Number 3. The Graveyard I walk by a graveyard every day, to and from the train. It's never been something that has bothered me before, though. Even in the fall and winter, when it gets dark earlier, it has never bothered me. I've never quite understood why it is that people are scared of graveyards, because they are technically supposed to be religious places. I just never got it. I took the train to and from school because I went to school the next town over. The school was better there, and my parents paid extra to have me go. I also made it onto the football team there, and I was usually always coming home late during the fall due to practice. I got used to walking by the graveyard each time, and as I mentioned, it never bothered me. I was coming home from high school, I was a senior when this happened, in the late fall one evening. It was already very dark outside. 
It was also pretty chilly, and I recall my breath making that breath fog. I was shivering a bit because I was only wearing my letter jacket, and it really wasn't the warmest jacket. I stopped when I thought I heard a voice, though very faint, ask, Help me! I looked around because the voice seemed to be coming from the graveyard. It had completely caught me off guard. Looking around the graveyard, I didn't see anything at first, but after a moment, I saw a shadow move quickly behind a large tomb. I didn't really think much about it. It was October and Halloween was coming up, so it made sense that other kids would be trying to pull pranks in the graveyard. I just tried to put it out of my mind and kept walking. I didn't get more than a couple steps further when the very faint sound of Help me! came across the graveyard once again. I stopped walking again, torn between thinking that it had to be someone trying to play a prank and wondering if someone might actually be in some sort of trouble. I'm a pretty big guy, and I doubted any kids would be too stupid to try and prank me. And if it wasn't a prank, and someone really was in some sort of danger, I would hate myself later if I would not have been able to save them, simply because I thought it was a prank. I looked back in the graveyard by that tomb. I didn't see anything there this time. I decided to go ahead and make my way over to it, just to see if something was going on. If it was a prank, I figured I'd just beat the crap out of the kids who were playing it. I stepped over the very small fence and made my way into the graveyard. There was a road and a path in there which made me pretty happy. I was not afraid of graveyards like I mentioned, but I held them in regard. I did not want to be disrespectful and walk on anyone's grave. I didn't hear any more cries for help, but I figured that whatever I was looking for was coming from the tomb. It was the general area the voice was coming from and it was the area that I had seen the shadow moving by, so I made my way over there. When I had gotten around the tomb, I heard another noise off further in the graveyard. Looking in this direction, I saw three distinct shadowy forms off amongst the graves. There really wasn't enough light to make out anything other than their shape. They all were standing behind smaller gravestones and looking at me. I was concerned at first, but all they did was look at me. I have to admit, it was very eerie as they didn't move for a while, and even with my eyes adjusted to the dark, I couldn't really see much other than their shadowy form. I kept waiting to see if they were going to do anything. After a few moments, even though there were three of them and only one of me, something must have convinced them to leave because all three of them turned and ran off through the graveyard. At that point, I was convinced it must have just been a prank. One of the three people must have been calling for help to try and lure me into the graveyard. I shook my head at the lameness of their joke and turned to walk back to the sidewalk. When I turned around, though, I noticed the lock on the tomb was broken. Again, I was irritated because of the disrespect for the dead. I almost walked away but I began to worry that someone might be caught down in the tomb. After looking around to make sure those guys were not coming back, I opened up the heavy door to the tomb. It was dark, 
but I could tell right away that there wasn't anyone in the tomb. But what I saw was even worse, at least in my estimation. The coffins in the tomb were broken open, and the bodies were taken out and ripped to pieces. There were arms, legs, and skulls laying strewn around the ground of the tomb. Bones were placed around on the ground, forming a circle on the ground, with more parts forming a circle inside of that circle, and so on. I felt sick to my stomach and immediately left the tomb. For the first time since I had entered the graveyard, I actually was a bit frightened. I was worried that the people I ran into might be devil worshippers or something like that. Even if they weren't, they were obviously pretty sick people. I was wary on my way out of the graveyard and the rest of the walk home had me on edge. I kept expecting to run into those three shadowy forms again, and who knew what they'd be up to. I had my parents call the police when I got home to report the vandalism. As far as I was aware, nothing ever ever come of it though. No one was ever caught. But every time after, as I walked by that graveyard on the way home in the dark, I was finally frightened. Each time I walked by the graves. Hey everyone, Killer Orange Cat here. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please feel free to hit the like button. If you're not subscribed to Killer Orange Cat, please feel free to hit the button next to the Tabby Cat to be informed when new videos come out. I'd like to thank The Fear for joining me in this trilogy of stories. It was definitely my pleasure to work with him. He's a very funny, very nice guy, and he's very, very talented. Please click on the link to visit his channel and subscribe. I'm a big fan of his, and I'm convinced that if you listen to his videos, you will become a big fan of his too. I really hope to see his channel continue to grow. I also want to thank everybody who gave me such positive feedback on the Q&A video. I especially was very flattered by the positive response to my face reveal, although a little surprised that so many people were surprised that I look like I look. <laughs> I hope my voice wasn't so bad that it doesn't seem like I could have it, but I'm mostly just being silly. I appreciate all the positive feedback and all the compliments. I always appreciate those too. Now there's one question I didn't get to. Monica XX and I promised her that I would answer that at the end of this video. So her question is, what's your cat inside of in your channel pick? Well, Ichigo is inside of a potato bin. Now the story of how he got in there is a little strange because I open that potato bin up a whole lot and whenever I do he tends to jump in it. So for that particular time I had opened the potato bin and I had left the room and I don't know if one of the other cats pushed the door open but he jumped into it and somehow when I came back the door was closed I figure one of the other cats must have done it I don't know but I grabbed my cell phone real quick and snapped a picture of it before I freed him he was only in there for a moment and it didn't stop him from jumping back in there the next time I opened it Alright then, I'll see you soon for the next video, and as always, make sure to check in your closet and check under the bed, because you never know where a killer orange cat might be hiding. Good night.